What's the difference between a gargoyle and a grotesque? The answer coming up next on the best art show in the DMV, Artico, art in your community. Chantal Wong was born in Shanghai and raised in the Bay Area. Though her degrees were in engineering, she decided that what needed some real fixing was Washington, D.C., and she's been here for close to 30 years. Wong has held many positions in the Clinton, Obama, and Bush administrations, but it wasn't until she retired that she found a new passion, photography, and she hasn't looked back. It became an obsession. Uh, and then somehow became a profession. I actually get paid for doing some of the work. Uh, and I was very lucky to join uh, John Lewis um, for four years to be his uh, photographer and videographer, thanks to an organization called the Faith and Politics Institute, where they bring members of Congress to civil rights sites in Alabama. So it's been an incredible experience for me uh, just because I picked up the camera. <laughs> it's just a very incredible ex uh, opportunity and uh, for me to be so close to this giant of a man. Uh, I would say that he was, when he was alive, a uh, living saint, if there was one. Uh, and to, to have that opportunity to not just be next to him, but the people that he surrounded himself with, the civil rights icons. So we would visit the 16th Street Baptist Church, for example. Uh, we would actually get the uh, reenactments of the 16th Street Baptist Church, the four little girls that, that were uh, killed on that Sunday. And then we crossed the bridge with John Lewis. Uh, and I remember uh, we did that this last time, uh, last March. Uh, he was weak, uh, he was definitely not himself, uh, he was very sick, uh, but he got on the bridge and his voice was booming. Uh, he told us what we need to do. He gave us that clarion call that we need to vote like we've never voted before. It's very emotional for me uh, to have been there, to be part of history, and I remember that, uh, you know, months later, what he said about voting, I went to Georgia in January, in December, actually. You know, every piece of the elect election was important, but Asian Americans, we were part of the margin of victory uh, in Atlanta, and I also went out to Savannah. Uh, in other parts of Georgia, who after we won, uh, we flipped the two, two seats, uh, both Ossoff and uh, Warnock. I went to visit John Lewis in his gravesite uh, in Atlanta and uh, told him that this one was for him, that he told us we need to do, and we did. I think uh, that, that picking up the camera really gave me the inspiration to see the world in a very different light. I'm still learning, uh, definitely learning about light, lighting <laughs> and what the camera captures. Sometimes it's actually better than the naked eye. After I retired, I actually did a little bit of a stint as a tech startup uh, entrepreneur for a year and a half, but basically after that, I fully retired uh, and I started doing a lot of travel. My God, you know, that that is what with a passport and a camera, <laughs> I'm in my happy place to meet people. I love to talk to people, to engage people, and then take photos of them. So my images, uh, besides the beauty of the places, uh, a lot of it is really engaging uh, the people and, and taking portraitures of, of the people that I get to meet. We got there for the sunrise. It was the most serene, beautiful place on earth. Uh, the longest teak bridge in the world. 
You know, I'm very active in the local community of the photographers uh, in the community. So I'm sitting on the board of a, um, uh, an organization called Focus on the Story. And Focus on the Story is about helping other photographers really be better storytellers. We've uh, published a couple of books. Uh, one of them is the, uh, to document the three days around the uh, Trump inauguration. There was riots and there was intensity and uh, Antifa and the Black Lives Matter. Uh, we were all capturing a lot of that. And then the next day was the Women's March where millions came to Washington. Very pleased that my photo <laughs> made the cover of that book. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's one of my proudest moments because it, we're here in Washington to shine a light on critical issues, to bridge cultural divide, and using visual imagery, whether it's videos or, or uh, images, to spur social change. And that's what I think photography is, uh, at least for me, that it has to have a purpose, uh, that it changes people's lives. Sonia Clark is a world-renowned mixed-media artist. A professor at Amherst College, the Washington native addresses race, systemic bias, heritage, and visibility in her new exhibition. The provocative Tatter, Bristle, and Mend is now on display at the National Museum for Women in the Arts. Included are numerous works made from human hair, black thread resembling human hair, and images that reference head adornment, like Afro Abe, for example. And I often say, like, my, my artistic journey has been very much like the curl pattern of my hair. Our hair holds that DNA that says, you know, Katie and I are essentially the same. Um, but our hair also will distinguish us in, into races. So hair is this way of bringing people together and also talking about racial categorization, racial subjugation, um, racial um, creativity, right? <laughs> Cultural creativity. Um, and and um, can, can be used in this way, either to talk about terrible things, like each strand of hair, um, being a representation of the 80,000 people that were forcibly migrated in one year during the height of slavery. The beautiful cultures to which I belong and the consistent subjugation of um, those cultures, and I say cultures in the plural because Black people are not a monolith, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and um, the constant subjugation of those cultures, like white supremacy is deeply um, embedded into this nation. And if the anthropologists have this right, then we are all children of Africa. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this idea that when you're looking at this, this texture of hair, it is standing in for African people of African descent. Clark loves to amplify the work of hairstylists, seeing them as artists in their own right. Many of her images pay homage to their creations. There are sculptures made of black pocket combs, including a large portraiture of Madame C.J. Walker and even a hair salon chair. Sonia's parents were both born in the Caribbean, their ancestors forced to that region by one of the engines of the transatlantic slave trade, sugar. Some of her images reference this history. When I go to the Caribbean, the smell, there's a smell in the air and that one of those smells can be the, the smell of burning cane. I wanted to take really common objects, you know, and seduce a little bit because sugar is, sugar is seductive. You know, um, sugar can get, sugar gives you a sugar high. It was sort of the drug of the time. Um, you know how, uh, not so much now, but there was a time that disturbingly people would refer to heroin chic. Mm -hmm. Well, there was also sugar chic. Mm -hmm. And that was that gentry who had the money to 
um, eat lots of sugar would show off their rotten teeth. So I think about these pieces, the, the gold rings um, that are holding these sugar crystals and the silver rings that are holding both cotton and hair and sugar, um, cast sugar, whose body would be wearing these rings? And even those ephemeral things, like the hair could come out and the sugar could dissolve and the cotton could come out, but still the structure that is holding those rings, that is turning people into commodity and commod and people who into workers, worker bees for this, you know, whatever the drug is of the time, that the structures are still in place, even though those materials might seem somewhat ephemeral. And there's more to explore in Sonia's work, including her amazing beadwork and hand symbology. You can catch her show at the National Museum of Women in the Arts until June 27th. The Gargoyle and Grotesque Tour at the National Cathedral is a fun way to explore and experience this beautiful building in all its whimsy. And with volunteer docents like Andrew Martin as your guide, you'll get all the fabulous stories behind these quirky and marvelous carvings. You hear lots of stories about why we have these ugly, horrible carvings on the outside of our beautiful churches. The first story that most kids hear is that it's to scare the evil spirits away. But the real reason that we have these on our buildings is far more prosaic than that. It's to get the rain off. A gargoyle is a carved downspout. The word gargoyle comes from the same root word as gargle, or in Spanish, garganta. It means throat. So if it doesn't have a throat, if it doesn't have a pipe, it's not a gargoyle, it's a grotesque. Dean Sayer, one of the builders of the cathedral, knew something else about gargoyles. In addition to scaring evil spirits away, serving as downspouts, there's something else about gargoyles, and it's the reason you're watching today. Gargoyles are awesome. People love gargoyles. So Dean Sayre added gargoyles as a fundraising technique. Many of the, if not all of the gargoyles are sponsored by someone and they got to pick the design. They've depicted family pets, relatives, or just designs that they've picked. So many of the gargoyles around here have stories that come from the people who donated money to help build the cathedral. We do have some pop culture ones. Uh, some of the gargoyles were the res result of a design a gargoyle contest. Right above our heads is Darth Vader. So if you follow this buttress up. There were over 1,900 entries from around the world and they picked the four best and actually carved those grotesques and added them to the towers of the cathedral. So the farther of these two gargoyles is described as a toothy duck. That's the one that has the bird on it right there. And you can see he's holding playing cards. You can see the suits of the playing cards underneath his wing there. So it's a rather fantastical design, but if you look closely, in the duck's mouth, where the bird just fluttered, you can see a tiny little cameraman peering out. The official name for this gargoyle is Candid Camera, and it represents and honors everyone who comes here to the cathedral to take pictures, all of the tourists and visitors. So if you are inspired by this show to come to the cathedral and visit for yourself, this will be your gargoyle. These are actually false gargoyles. They don't have pipes, but the, these are a pair that honor the two children of the donors who gave the money. So this is the little girl, and it was designed so that the pipe of the gargoyle would run out the mouth of her doll that she's playing with. You see, the, there's the mouth of the doll, and there's the, the feet of the doll that she's playing with. And this one represents their son, and it's a little boy climbing a tree, and he appears to have just caught a fish. And the mouth of the gargoyle uh, the pipe would have run right out the mouth of the big fish that he's caught right there. I've been giving tours at the National Cathedral for over 10 years now, and every single time I come here, I spot something new. This huge schnozzed gargoyle is called the yuppie. But since our notion of what a yuppie is has kind of moved on, we usually refer to him as the businessman. The money for this gargoyle was given by a wife to depict her husband. And it's not the most flattering of depictions. He's got a really long hair because he was always so busy at the office making money that he never had time to get a haircut. 
He's got that enormous nose and his other hand, which you can't see. In one hand, he's holding the briefcase. In his other hand, which you can't see, he has a divining rod, which is shaped like a dollar sign, which he uses for sniffing out the almighty dollar. This is one of my favorite grotesques at the cathedral. This guy right here, chowing down on a drumstick. You can see his big old teeth. You can see his boogers there and everything. This is part of a matched set, and he's called Gluttony. And his mirror image is on the other side of this buttress. And opposite Gluttony is this guy with the hollowed, sunken cheeks. This is famine, starving to death. This is one of the most fun grotesques on the cathedral. This is official name is toothsome, but most of the docents call him chompers. This is another matched set of grotesques. We have old age on this side of the buttress. And on this side of the buttress, we have infancy, a little baby holding a rattle, having a temper tantrum. A lot of the grotesques reflect what was going on when this part of the cathedral was built. This was built in the 80s during Reagan. And this guy who's holding a bomb and whose hair is made out of bomb represents the fear of nuclear war. You can see that on the other side, his finger is on the button. Opposite the warmonger, cowering in fear behind a gas mask is the pacifist. So that's the duality of, of the warmonger and the pacifist. Behind me are two particularly fun gargoyles. On the left is an old nursery rhyme, Tom, Tom the Piper's son, stole a pig and away did run. He's a pig thief. He's riding his stolen pig and he's got a goose that he's stolen, clutching it by the neck. On the other side, you can see that the farmer's guard dog has caught him and is clinging to his sleeve. Behind the pig thief is a cute little bunny rabbit that's being devoured by a boa constrictor. This gargoyle is a hippie. You can see he's got bare feet, he's got bell bottoms, he's got patched and torn clothing, he's got a protest sign, He's got a musical instrument. But of course, you need one thing that's far more important than a musical instrument, a protest sign, long hair and torn clothing to be a hippie, and that is doobage. So this bag right there contains the hippie's supply of primo weed. We have that directly from the artist himself. And that might be why the cathedral makers decided to put it away here in a corner where it can only be seen from a tiny little access stairway. The cathedral is still closed for worship because of COVID. We're beginning to reopen for special events. We do not have gargoyle tours or tower climbs scheduled yet, but watch the website. And as soon as we're reopening, we will be letting everyone know. And I encourage you to check the website and book your gargoyle tour or your tower climbs. It's a truly magical experience. Howard University's theater students took on the challenging themes of race, resilience, and resistance and created a series of short digital plays. The production was called Broadview, and it was the result of a collaboration with Studio Theater and inspired by one of its plays. Good morning, brothers and sisters. There's a protest today in front of Fort Reeves. Be there. Oh, here you go, brother. Thank you, sister. The project was a studio theater residency with Howard University um, and it surrounded, the plot kind of surrounded um, the show Passover. Um, the director, Salmanyani 24, he came and um, uh, decided to work out this residency with Howard students to create like devised theater pieces um, in tandem with like the material from the show. So it's a black waiting for Godot. It involves two black men who are sitting at a lamppost and they're trying to make it off, make it outside the ghetto. They're trying to leave their block. But every time they try to leave their block, um, uh, the police officer comes and scares them. We had to read the play before um, like creating our pieces. So we wrote our own material. Um, we created our own choreography. Um, we, we, with the help of a sound designer and a director and a choreographer, were able to piece together like different sound bites from different pieces of music. Um, we used our own houses, our own apartments. We went around the street and filmed. It incorporates a musical component. It incorporates a dance component. It incorporates um, synchronized movement. It incorporates uh, tableaus and statues and images. And we devised a short digital 
um, story um, that kind of used like device theater elements, except it was completely digital. So it was a, um, a unique experience. I would describe the Broadview project as a series of vignettes depicting black life. Be like a preacher, teacher, protester, captures a day in the life of a black person and how they come across um, police brutality. Just over there doing each character kind of confronts the police officer and there is a common response that happens that um, the like a ritual that the actors go into in the piece it was it was interesting being able to like use our theater practices that happen usually in person and to use that same listening and responding and collaboration on a digital platform God, help us all. Michael Phillips is a jazz producer and creator of the Yard Work Concerts. Two years ago, he started Jazz Kitchen Productions and began programming jazz for local spots like Tacoma Station. His work put him in touch with a lot of musicians, many of whom would be out of work when the pandemic hit. Seeing a need, he decided to help. Uh, you know, I, there's, an, there's a thing in, in Baltimore called Sidewalk Serenades. So I got the idea from them, and they do like these little 20 minute things on sidewalks in front of people's houses. And I thought, that's great, although 20 minutes is too short. I like the idea. And so I started this up and uh, just hiring all these jazz groups to go out and play, and uh, it's worked out great. Um, we got involved with the yard work concerts um, from the listserv, the local listserv. We saw a, um, um, an email from Michael Phillips, and um, and we had been missing um, missing live music because we like to go to concerts. We we love jazz. We love music in general. So um, when I saw it, I jumped at it because it so, it sounded so easy, and it was right you know at the beginning of the pandemic, and we were, we were all missing music. I actually love them. My friends can come over, and I love hearing jazz. I. I used to play the violin. I stopped for a little, and then I picked back up with the piano. And I'm starting to really like the beat. People are going, oh my goodness, this was so good. Thank you so much, and they're joyous because a lot of them haven't seen any live music in a really long time. You know, during the pandemic, one of the things that a lot of us were doing were li uh, live streaming concerts. Okay, you know, you get in there, you stream it, it's a way to connect and, and people have people tip, but it's so awkward. As a, as a performer, when you're performing, you're playing your piece, you take a great solo, you finish the end of a great tune, and there's nothing. You don't have that interaction, it's very awkward. It's just, it, it's, it's strange, it's foreign. And so, doing these has been meaningful. It's a safe way to play before people live, and especially when we've been so separated during the pandemic, it's like an extra level of, a cathartic kind of connection to, to be together with folks again. And these guys decided to be full-time jazz musicians. And it took as much work to get that, you have to be so good on your instrument and so good at improvising.
It takes years and years, just like it takes years to become a lawyer or a doctor. Um, but they, in their case, they knew this was going to be a tough life. There's not how many people can be Herbie Hancock or Wynton Marcellus. You're not going to make a lot of money, most likely. But they chose it. And so it's tough even during normal times, let alone when the pandemic hits. So they're, you know, they really deserve the support. Oh, I'll keep, I'll keep doing this until, until the weather turns, like in early November. And, uh, but you know what? A lot of people have, have said that this should keep going even after the pandemic is over because it's so nice to have jazz on a nice day in your yard with your friends, with the trees and the sky. Wonderful music by the best musicians in the Mid-Atlantic. That's the end of our show. Thanks for watching, and until next time, always remember to follow your art.